Hi, my name is Wojtek Wojcicki. I'm the CEO of AGX Minerals. AGX Minerals is a Lundin Group exploration company exploring in the Vicuña district in Chile and Argentina. We've got two main projects, Luna Wasi, which is probably the most exciting new high-grade exploration play in the world. And then our second project is the much more advanced Los Alados copper gold silver deposit in Chile. Wojtek, thank you very much for the introduction. Good to see you again. Um, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. Now, we haven't spoken for, for several months, uh, Wojtek. I think it was kind of the, um, the first half of last year. But I've been following your news releases with great interest. Um, and it seems like I'm not the only one. Uh, the, Crux is at the moment, Crux Investor is doing a review of the TSX 50 uh, companies every year, the TSX Venture comments and hands out awards to the best performing com uh, companies on the on the exchange. And NGX is in there um, uh, with an award. Um, it's always nice to get plaudits. Uh, were you aware of this? Uh, yeah, no, we heard about it. It's a great honor. And, you know, in fact, NGX is a is a two time winner of the TSX Venture 50. We also won in 2022. It's been a great couple of years for the company. And it's really been driven by the success from the Lunawasi project. Uh, yeah, you've been putting out some spectacular results. Um, now, your market capitalization is uh, kind of pretty hefty now, you know, kind of you're up at $1.6 billion. Um, the share price has performed extremely well uh, in the last six months, obviously, not just the news releases, but the seeming, um, well, the strength in the copper price and seemingly kind of um, awakening in the investor sentiment, or, or perhaps I, I shouldn't jinx it by saying that, but it seems as if there's a little bit of interest coming back into the sector. But um, when did when did you join NGX? Because it wasn't in, 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 you, you've been with the company for a while now, haven't you? Yeah, so NGX is a company that we formed in 2008. Um, it's a Lundin Group exploration company. And in the, in the beginning, it was a roll-up of three separate kind of regional Lundin Group exploration companies. I was brought in to, to run the combined company, you know, sorted through the portfolio, decided to focus on the Vicuña District projects, which at the time were early-stage grassroots projects, but they looked really good. So we kind of sold off everything else that we had, focused on the Vicuña district, made three discoveries in short order, Filo del Sol, Los Salados, and Jose Maria. And then over the following years, as those projects matured, we did a series of spin-outs, which was a super successful strategy from an investor perspective. We spun out the Filo del Sol project in 2016, and then the Jose Maria project in 2019. Uh, and then sort of reformed NGX around Los Alados and uh, the Lunawasi project. Because my my attention on the district kind of really came, um, you know, I've been working variously internationally, and it was the Filo del Sol kind of discovery and the kind of the price moves four or five years ago, or um, now I guess um, six or seven years ago, that really kind of captured my, my imagination, you know, and um, NGX... To me, it's kind of a bit of a latecomer, you know, it's kind of a Johnny come lately. But actually what you're describing is that there's kind of quite a lot of prehistory. And in, in, in some ways, it's the, the the starting point for Filo and the starting point for Jose Maria. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's that's very accurate that, um, you know, really the spark for broader investor interest in the Vicuña district came with some spectacular results drilling the deeper part of the Filo del Sol project. So there was a you know, the first drill hole that we managed to get into the into the deeper, the first deeper drill hole into the center of that system really sparked the interest in, 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 in the overall district. But, you know, that in a way sort of masked or overshadowed a lot of the hard miles that, that came before that. But that's often how it goes in exploration. You, you know, you work, 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 and a lot of that early work is not necessarily rewarded by the market, but it's the, you know, it's all the setup that you do that, you know, that makes the later success seem like it came out of nowhere, but, but it rarely, yeah. you know, there's all, almost always a lot of hard work that goes behind it. An overnight success story. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> but in this Which case, is... only, you know, it's taken more than 20 years to get where, where we are today. If you look at the share price charts over the last four or five years, you know, it's, they're pretty steeply up, but there's a, there's a long period where we were doing a lot of the groundwork that, that set us up for success on, you know, on all three projects that, um, you know, that happened with less um, less fanfare, less profile. Funnily enough, I always um, 
think that that's kind of missing in the in the famous Lassonde curve, you know, you, because everybody talks about the discovery point, you know, when you first yeah. start getting those drill holes in, and then you the share price responds, and you, you, you are able to uh, publish or a company is able to publish a series of good intersections, one after another, so that the resource, the envelope of mineralization grows and grows and grows. But what it doesn't show is that that pre discovery timeline, which can be a really, really long time where you're just building your geological understanding, you're making, um, doing exploration holes, many of which fail. Yep, exactly. No, and I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very important point that you make. And I think it's very important for the, the NGX story right now, because we're, you know, a lot of that, you know, that long runway is, is behind us. And we're actually right at the sweet spot in the Lassonde curve, because that, the inflection point in that curve is really right after you make your initial discovery and, you know, a lot of the value, not just for exploration companies, but really if you look at the overall mining industry, that is where a lot of the value is created is between that initial discovery hole and when you define the resource and start working on your engineering study. So I think for NGX and from an investor perspective, what's really, I think we're just right in that sweet spot. We've just made the discovery. We're just at the beginning stages of starting to define something that we think is you know, got some real potential. Um, and there is a lot of upside from, from where we're at today. You know, Lunawasi at this point has, um, you know, about 20 drill holes, holes in it. Um, the Fila del Sol project, you know, our neighbor six kilometers to the South has got over, over 300 drill holes, you know, so we're, we're just at those very early stages of value definition, which, um, or value creation, which is, you know, as an investor, that's exactly where you want to be. The project's been, de-risked a little bit you've made that initial discovery so you know you've got something good but a lot of the um the value is still in front of you playing devil's advocate could could one not say that you know the market's kind of run to a degree you you know you were, your share price was two dollars a, a few years back or um and, uh, and a bit lower you know before that and you're yeah. now above eight dollars you know you've you, you, the value's grown f- over four times your your market capitalization is one and a half billion you know, is, is is the goose cooked? Yeah, I would argue that it's that it's not. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that if you look at historical world class discoveries and you can look at the, the, the share price chart for Fila del Sol, that's a good one to look at. But there's a lot of other discoveries historically. And what you see over and over again is an initial run up on the announcement of the discovery hole, you know, and that yeah. can be anywhere from. 100 to 200 to 400 percent um you know in that initial run up yeah. on the discovery hole there's typically a period of consolidation but what's what's interesting is that the vast majority of the value in these big discoveries and that's you know if you go back and you look at famous stories like Boise's bay or aurelian or um or oyu tolgoy a lot of the value came after that initial discovery you know and, and yeah. so typically it's that you know a hot, couple of hundred um, percent in that in that first run up, and then you know a thousand percent after that. Once people start to realize the significance of what's been found, and that's exactly what the Lassonde curve would would predict. The inflection point is the discovery hole. The value creation, the serious value creation, happens after that. So I would argue that NGX is still in the very very early stages of that, or Lunawasi is in the very early stages of that, and then. I think what people shouldn't forget is that the valuation is also underpinned by the Los Alados project, which is one of the largest undeveloped copper gold deposits in South America. You know, it's much more advanced. It's got lots of drilling in it. It's got a 2 billion tons of 0.5 indicated, um, and it's 17 kilometers from the operating Castorones mine. So, you know, that's a much more advanced asset, very large resource. Um, you know, with a different sort of a uh, stage and spin to it that that also underpins that valuation that you see. So it's not just it's not just Linawasi. There's there's something else to it. You've you've got this um, track record of spinning things out and kind of um, yeah. you know f- working uh, understanding what works in a company at a certain given time. Um, presumably, you you have that conversation at the board level or in your own head on a regular basis. You know, does yeah. do these does this combination of assets fit together? Um, you know, it, yep. could they be better? Should Alados, Los Alados be with, I don't know, Filo or with 
um, you know, who's who's closer? I, I, I can't re- remember the uh, geography. Yeah, it would be Lundin Mining's Castoranis mine. Yeah. That's closer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that conversation is one that we have on an ongoing basis. It's, you know, the, the spin-outs and a well-thought-out, well-timed spin-out strategy is a, is a big part of the $5 billion worth of value that's been created in this district by Angie X and its, its predecessor companies. So, you know, we definitely like the spin-out approach. The, the reason for the success of the previous spin-outs, though, is that they were very well thought out, you know, and the timing, uh, the timing is critical. And the number mm. one factor in deciding whether you do a spin-out is, you know, are you, is there some is is an asset being undervalued in in your current current portfolio and would it be valued better separately so that that's the fundamental question like why are you doing this you're doing it because you think you know there's a piece of your portfolio that's undervalued so whenever we see that or we think that that's there um you know that's when we've that's when we've done the spin outs i don't think we're 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 there right now with the ngx assets i actually think they're probably worth more together at this point Mm, interesting. Um, but if that changes and, you know, we see any chance, I mean, we're big shareholders in these companies. So if we see any opportunity to um, to surface more value by doing a spin out, we'd certainly look at it. But um, it's not something that we're considering right now just because, the um, yeah, for a variety of reasons, we think the assets are better together for now. There's also chatter out in the market about um the, the the converse you know that the now that there's been you, you the the lundin group's got casseroni's oper- in operation you've got los elados you've got filo you've got a filo del sol um uh you've got the kind of emerging lunawasi you know th- th- there's there's the converse which could be kind of a a, a roll-up or a consolidation um you know at some point with your corporate finance head-on that also has to be a consideration, surely. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's true. I think the the spin out strategy and and putting these these uh, assets into separate public companies made a lot of sense at the exploration stage. Um, no question, that generated a, a huge amount of value, and it was the right strategy. But as the district starts to shift to looking ahead to how do you put this together, how do you put this into production? I think the calculus does change, and these assets are geographically close. Um, there's a lot of potential synergies. You know, there's a lot of potential fits between the different mm. different assets. So I think as you start to look at uh, towards production, um, consolidation definitely makes sense. Um, you know, that that kind of happens in the background. I mean, my job as CEO of NGX is to maximize the value of, of NGX minerals and, and our assets. You know, if, 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 a, if a roll up comes along and, and our shareholders benefit from that, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, I, you know, stepping outside of that, I definitely can see the logic to the consolidation, you know, when it happens, how it happens, um, you know, that's to, to be seen. But 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 there's definitely a logic to bringing the assets together. And then the the the, the kind of the the next logical kind of continuation of that conversation is that these are uh, uh, high remote complex engineering projects with water challenges and mineralogical challenges um, that are long term, long lived, high capital projects which are best suited in a kind of a syndicated approach, really. Yeah. Um, And I think, you know, that probably the way to think about them in terms of a development scenario, I think you look at all of the big districts in in the central Andes, um, they're typically developed by a syndicate or a consortium of companies. The interesting thing in the in the Vicuña district is that over the last couple of years, we've started to see some of the players that you typically see in the development of these of these other big districts um, kind of in play or active in the Vicuña district. So we've had BHP take an equity stake in Filo Mining. We've had Lundin Mining buy Casarone or buy an interest in Casarones and buy Jose Maria. We, of course, got our long-term Japanese partners, JX Nippon. You know, and so those are some of the pieces that you typically see in the development of these districts. So, you know, a Western mining company or two, um, you know, often Japanese partners smelting and kind of concentrate offtake um, skills, you know, those are the, the typical partners that develop a lot of the, the, the big districts. So, um, you know, we'll see how the Vicuña district develops, but that's one big change over the last couple of years. This is no longer a junior exploration play 
Um, you know, it's got some really big players now, um, at least, you know, taking a look at the district and starting activity there. It slightly fits the narrative that the this the majors and the kind of the the, the big conglomerates are sometimes they talk a big game on exploration, but um, fundamentally they they are also very happy purchasing in on a de-risked asset. I mean, um, I know BHP is kind of often run with that, and I know that Rietinter has had success at um, we knew in Australia and BHP is with the Oak Dam, and then you've got the the resolution in in Arizona again Rietinter and BHP. But in terms of the 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 run rate of exploration it, it feels that this is kind of a better suited approach to them that they let the juniors kind of do the exploration and then they come come in with a balance sheet and their kind of engineering expertise as a consortium partner or syndicate partner yeah. later on yeah i would i would i would agree with that you know the um the junior exploration corporate structure and the approach i think is um arguably better for better suited for exploration it it, it you know, it's kind of able to take the risk. It's able to have the quick decision making and the lower overhead, um, you know, than than is possible in a larger organization. But then, once you get to development, you really need that balance sheet. I mean, really, that's how you, you know, the Lassonde curve really was developed to explain what happens when large projects are in junior companies. The you know the bigger companies can kind of absorb that. You know, no one's looking at them day to day while they're. You know, doing a feasibility study, no one's wondering how they're going to raise the capital to develop the project. So, yeah, that it's it's that that's definitely the logical approach. I think that the juniors and I think a well-funded junior exploration group like us, like the Lund, like the Lundin Group, junior exploration companies. I think we're we're good at doing this. We de-risk these assets, and the biggest de-risking that we do is making that initial discovery. Because when you look at the overall returns for for exploration, the reason that you know, they, they look high risk and they look low on a kind of on a consolidated 100 percent basis is so many early stage exploration projects fail. Uh, but once you've made that initial discovery, once you've done that initial work, you've really, really beat the odds. And I think for the big guys, it makes a lot of sense to step in at that point when, you know, so much of the discovery risk has been taken out. So I think, you know, that's exactly what you're going to see going forward. Um exploration like you say the the bigger companies talk about it a lot they do some of it um but there certainly hasn't been enough done to to make the discoveries and generate the assets that we're going to need for this coming copper boom you know there's a real yeah. shortage of this sort of project and i think that's going to make the kind of things that that we've found uh, extremely valuable over the next couple of years i agreed 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 um Tell me about Argentina because there's there's dynamic change in Argentina at the moment, yeah. and it's, it's it's very hard for an outsider to to get a feel for what's going on. Um, yeah. It looks good in terms of um, the, the I know it's shock tactics, but I just wondered what you're what you're seeing. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been working in Argentina for sixteen, seventeen years now, and the Lundin Group has been active in Argentina for over thirty. So we've got a lot of experience, and we've worked through you know all sorts of political conditions um, and been very successful at it. You know, the Lundin Group, earlier companies were responsible for two of the biggest um, mining operations in Argentina, Bajo de la Lumbrera and Veladero. So we've been able to generate very good shareholder returns and very good returns for, for the country of Argentina over time. Um, I mean, that said, I think, you know, the new government is in Argentina is, I think, making some proposals that I think will make it easier for large scale long term foreign investment like mining to be made um, you know it'll they're attempting to remove some of the distortions that have kept crept in over time and have made it difficult for people to put money to work um, it's early days and you know i think president millet is is doing his best i think his you know his his ideas are are good um, you know the challenges are are political and getting that through uh, through congress but i think you know, I think it's a it's a good start, and um, you know, if he succeeds, I think it'll be good for Argent. It succeeds in opening up the economy and attracting foreign investment. It will be good for Argentina, and it will be good for it'll be good for the world, frankly, because um, you know, copper is definitely going to be one of the assets that we need over the next couple of years. Argentina's got some some great projects that'll be unlocked with mm. um, with some of the changes that he's proposing. 
or very optimistic you know, about Argentina. Can you remind me, um, what, what's the kind of the, the, the build phase in, in San Juan province? Because you've got Jose Maria, there's um, the, um, a few other assets which are kind of in the late stage of um, technical studies. Is anything being actually built at the moment? Uh, not at the moment. So Jose, in, the, in the Vicuña district, Jose Maria, which I should point out is not owned by NGX, it's owned by Lundin Mining. Uh, yeah. That's the most advanced project actually in Argentina right now. And it's at the um, feasibility studies have been completed. Um, some of the some of, some there's some early works programs going on, uh, but they have not yet made a construction decision. But in terms of stage of projects and projects that, that could be moved forward, um, you know, Jose Maria, I believe, is the, the most advanced copper project in Argentina right now. But uh, just. Highlight, that's a lending mining project, not NGX. Um, but Argentina Watchers, that's the kind of one to have on your radar to kind of indicate whether serious capital is being deployed into the country. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Good. The plan for this year, um, you're drilling. Um, the, the, when I look at your news releases, it kind of, it, uh, it, my mind kind of uh, boggles at the topography that you're dealing with. I mean, do you, I mean, is it, too high for helicopters do you how do you get your rigs um, you changed the name of your asset from um um potro cliffs which i thought was a, there was a clue in the title to uh luna wasi which is a lot more romantic and um um makes it seem as if the engineering is a lot easier but um it, it, it probably is quite a challenging environment in which to operate isn't it yeah i mean we're we're definitely in a high andes environment i mean it's very similar to the to to the other projects it's very similar to the environment that the operating casserones mine is in uh but there's no question you know we're at high elevations here over four thousand meters and and in the andes um that said you know the access is actually quite good we've got a very good road network through the area, so we don't we don't use helicopter access. We've got a road network that, you know, allows us to move around the, the project, all the projects very easily. Um, yeah, we use truck mounted drill rigs, and um, yeah, the access is maybe not quite as difficult as the as the photographs might make it seem. We've been operating in this area for a very long time. We've got a lot of a lot of skills at operating in this environment, and it's not a particular challenge. You know, there's there's no such thing as easy exploration, and and this is no. well within the the range of um, you know kind of a the comfort zone for for operations. Do you take a winter break for snows and and cold weather and short days? Yeah, EGX does. Um, Philo right now, you know, which is only six kilometers to the south of us, they operate year round. It's really just a um, a cost and stage of project issue. It gets it does get colder. Um, you do get snow, and it gets more expensive because of all of that. So up until now, NGX has been stopping for a couple of months in the southern hemisphere winter. Um, but when we get to the point that year-round operations make sense. Um, there's no particular issue with, with operating through the winter. It's just a matter of, of, uh, of winterizing equipment, winterizing um, you know, water supply and things like that, and there's not a particular issue. Philo's drilled very successfully through the last two winters, and, and we could certainly do that when the, when the time is right. And uh, just kind of wrapping up in terms of kind of budget and the amount of rigs you've got and how many um, budget, either dollar terms or, or meter, meterage that you've got planned for this year, w what are you looking at? Yeah, so Linawasi right now, we've got four drills working and they've been working since um, the middle of October. We've set out kind of an initial target of 15,000 meters, uh, but we're on track, I think, to exceed that. The drilling's gone gone faster and, and, and it's been under budget. So uh, I think we're going to be able to extend the season past our original end date. And I'd expect that we'll, uh, we'll try and drill through to the end of May. Um, I mean, the results have been really good from Lunawasi. And I, I, thought, I thought maybe I'd just take the opportunity to, to highlight just how extraordinary they've been and maybe go through some of the, some of the results. So, you know, our last news release had a couple of, I think, you know, really noteworthy numbers. So there was 72 meters of 9.6% copper equivalent. That's mostly copper with accessory gold and silver. So I think just for the viewers that or listeners that, that, that don't think about this stuff all the time, 72 meters is about the height of a 24-story building. 
you know, so the next time you're in a big office tower, you know, up on the somewhere up in the twenties, look out the window and see how far it is down to the street. Seventy meters is a really impressive intercept. The other really spectacular intercept, and I think it's another number to think about, was twenty three meters of twenty three percent copper equivalent. So, you know, just to put that twenty three percent into context, most copper mines grade you know, a, a big copper mine in Chile would average somewhere around point, between 0.5 and 0.7% copper. And then billions of dollars are spent building processing facilities to take that 0.5% material and turn it into a concentrate that grades between 25 and 30%. So one of the really remarkable things at Lunawasi is that nature has done that concentrating for you. And the mineralization that you're drilling is, is very close to the average concentrate grade. And then the final number I want to highlight was, um, you know, one of our longer drill intercepts from Lunawasi was just over 460 meters of just over 1% copper equivalent. And that's a really important intercept because what we've been drilling to date are very high-grade structures, as illustrated in those earlier intercepts. But that longer one is now starting to show us potentially, you know, what the larger system that drove those high-grade structures that we've drilled to date might look like. And it's starting to give us indications of volume um, to go along with the very high grades that those early drill holes hit. So a super exciting time and um, lots more drill results to come. You know, we're, uh, we've released four holes so far and, you know, there's a lot more to come uh, before the end of the season. Great. Thank you. And what's the, kind of news, what's the plan for uh, Los Helados? Well, Los Helados has a lot of, you know, despite the amount of work that we've done on it, um, still has a lot of exploration upside. However, this year, you know, we decided to focus on Lunawasi for, for obvious reasons. Uh, we still have a fairly small team. We can't do everything. So the efforts are going into 100% into Lunawasi this year. Um, but we're looking right now at, um, you know, whether we've got the bandwidth to maybe run a program to test some of our, ex our really good exploration ideas at Los Alados next season. So uh, we'll see. You know, in part, it depends on on um, on on how much we have to do at Lunawasi. I'm I'm anticipating that still being the focus, given the results that we're getting so far. So you know, we'd like to do both, but um, in these smaller companies, sometimes it's hard to to do two things, and you got to really focus on the best. And and Lunawasi is clearly yeah, yeah where we're generating the most value. Uh, more children equals more hungry mouths. Exactly. Um, what's your what's your treasury situation like at the moment? We're in good shape. We raised um, 80, $85 million in August of 2023. I mean, obviously, we're working through that in this program. Um, I think our cash at the end or our last uh, end of our last quarter was around $70 million. Uh, we've got our quarterly financials coming out in the next week or so. Um, so there'll be an update in that. But we're at around $70 million in December 31st. Foytek. Thank you so much. A real pleasure speaking to you. Um, good luck with all the exploration uh, this year and, uh, and enjoy the, the, the copper ride. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's, it's fun, isn't it? Yeah, we've been waiting for a long time. I think, uh, you know, now we finally got these tailwinds and, you know, with the copper move in the copper price, you, know, you typically see an increase in M&A activity. And, you know, that combined with the results that we continue to put out, I think, uh, you know, the future looks really bright for NGX. And I really appreciate you having us on. Uh, very good to see you.